cut. Okay, go cut. Ahead. Action, camera. Okay, She's my memory bank. She can come up with all the dates if I have to. Okay, that's right. good. All right, so why don't you tell us who you are? Who okay, are you? my name is George Sumner. It's actually Sumner George Anderson. I don't know if I should go into that whole thing, but I'm proud of my family name. And the only reason I kind of had to give it up after 25 years was it got a little confusing. I had AKA Sumner George Anderson Jr. Hmm. But when I got out of the Navy and I started painting full time, Anderson was like signing your paintings, John Doe. Hmm. So I never used my first name in my life up to that point because it was a dorky name. It was really <laughs> silly. Nobody would, nobody would ever you'd say Sumner and you'd crawl into the desk. Anyway, that's how I changed my name. To, eventually it got too confusing. People call me George Anderson and Sumner and Sumner George Anderson. So I slowly, regret, regrettably switched over to George Sumner, George which Sumner. I've been using that painting name for 50 years. Nice. That was a long-winded explanation. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> that's really good. So we're looking at how we value the beach and how the beach is important to a number of different people and a number of different backgrounds. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how the beach in the coastal zone has influenced you as an artist. And how we're so fortunate to live in a nearly 1,000-mile stretch of ocean. Yes. <clears throat> yes. I was born and raised in San Francisco. So naturally, that means the fog came in every day. Mm -hmm. And as a young boy, I used to deliver the morning papers and listen to the foghorns you know, early in the morning. And there was a mystery incorporated in that. And the older I became when moving around from San Francisco over to Marin County back and forth where the fog comes in like dry ice and pours over the hills, there's a magical component of nature really impressing its beauty, you know, and secrets. Mm -hmm. So I used fog and all my paintings, whether they were in the Nepali coastlines or even underwater marine life painting, it was still the technique of using fog as motion, soft and beautiful. Yes, oh, fog as motion. It is I like, love that. especially at, in Sausalito, where I had my studio for 37 years, every day you look up during the summer and the fog would be coming over, pouring over the top of the ridge like dry ice and then evaporating. But it would make all kind of convolutions, all, all types of abstracts. Mm -hmm. And I can look out my studio and look at it. And it gave me a lot of ideas for compositions. Mm -hmm. That's neat, a lot of ways to interpret that. A lot of but the intrinsic coming. value of the, the coastline I think we all agree on its beauty. I mean, how can anybody not go to the beach and, and find its... So I think for most people the reward is its incredible nature, natural forms and color and changing moods of the ocean, changing moods of, of uh, any type of thing that would give an artist inspiration. But I could go on to tell you about an interesting involvement I was with in the mid-60s. And that was what was happening called the Mendocino Whale Wars. And that was when our coastline was only 12 miles off the coast, our mm -hmm. international lines, instead of 250. And what was happening right at that very moment, <clears throat> well, I was an active artist in Mendocino. I had a gallery up there. But in the mid-60s, there were over 83,000 whales slaughtered in one year. It was the height of the, the whale slaughter. And what you could see from the Mendocino coastline were Japanese factory ships and Russian factory ships within the 12-mile limit at that, and slaughtering whales, sometimes 30, 40 a day. And nobody was saying a peep about it. Our government acted like nothing was happening because we didn't want to upset our trade agreements with Japan. For All we had to do was boycott televisions for six months and it would have mm -hmm. stopped whaling forever. And in essence, that's where I became involved with a, a group of activists and they called themselves the Mendocino Whale Warriors. 
and they would volunteer fishermen would take people out and put the ship the, their fishing boats surround the whaling factory ships with big signs stop whaling stop whaling this is before greenpeace became active in in anti-whaling and in fact that's what greenpeace when they were formed I joined them when there was only a couple of dozen people involved in it, <clears throat> but that's where it, that movement evolved from. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't from all of a sudden Greenpeace took on the whales, but they, they became active in which I vowed not to stop painting this until they stopped slaughtering them. And for, unfortunately, 50 years later, the, the, <clears throat> the myth of Japanese research ships, uh, you know, still allows whale I mean they're still indiscriminately killing whales in Antarctica primarily waters mm -hmm. but anyway the joyful part of it is that <clears throat> we did have an effect on the dolphin kill where mm -hmm. there were over 80,000 dolphins being killed we took that program to schools all over the country and I'm honored that I was part of stopping Starkius tuna, which had had really mm -hmm. primarily the the uh, I'm trying to remember the the gentleman that was president of the company at the time. He had just taken over from an older CEO, and he was very viable to drift nets, the drift net fishing, which mm -hmm. I guess we all understand how that works. But they chase the dolphins and then surround the dolphins because they're going after the tuna. Mm -hmm. And as a result, many, many dolphins were killed in the process. And when we approached Starkiss tuna, they said, so what if it's costing you a couple million dollars a day in <clears throat> profit? So the, the real bottom line was the CEO said, you know, George, when we were in his office, because I took him a painting of two dolphins and, and it was a presentation to try to get to him, to talk to him, which became very successful. He said that the profit margin to eliminate drift net fishing was less than a nickel a can of tuna. Oh, and he God. would that's put amazing. a stop to it and that's really what started it. It was educating young children to go home to tell their, pe their parents to boycott tuna Mm -hmm. You know, Starkiss was the, the bigger company. And that actually had a, an effect on parents writing in. And I think all in all, that was much more effective than the anti-whaling campaign because more people were endeared to dolphins mm -hmm. than whales. But the real, the, the tragedy of, we'd like to think all our activism stopped whaling. And really what it was, was the Russian and Japanese whaling fleets, the, the average life of a, a ship is 25 years old. They were rotting to pieces and it, they got to a point where when the whales population started to decline that they had to make a decision whether to rebuild all these ships or stop whaling. And, and primarily in 1972, they, most of the heavy whaling had, had slowed down, but there's still whaling going on. Mm -hmm. I know that's probably a, not mm. what you're looking for is interaction on the coastline. No, it's all related. It's a it, bit of history. Could I try something to maybe yeah. get you more Thank onto what you. these guys are talking about? So, yeah. can you tell us about when you were young, how did you first interact with the beach? <coughs> yeah, I, I grew up grew up in San Francisco, and the, what we would do every weekend is we called them, pardon the on fart sacks and what they were were <laughs> mattress covers that went over mattresses that if you went out to the ocean and you got them wet and you tied the end of them they'd be like water balloons mm -hmm. and you could surf in on the, the waves at uh -huh. an ocean beach in San Francisco yeah and that was a fad for a long time even even mm -hmm. up to when I was in high school and we all got arrested yeah you know from uh, <laughs> and what years what years were those well I graduated from high school and 1958 in the dark ages mm -hmm. <laughs> but so it was uh, my t my teenage years I spent a lot of time in the ocean at the ocean mm -hmm. then then later on I got involved when I went in the Navy I got involved with uh, doing some diving and spent a lot of time in the water in the Philippine Islands which are really beautiful but not too many whales over there yeah <laughs> 
So but, growing up on the coast then influence you more as an artist or more as an activist or? Yeah, I, I think I first became an activist when I was like Gabriel's age about saving the giant redwoods on the coast mm -hmm. because I saw, as uh, we all know, the politics involved that the initial Redwood National Forest was going to be taken maybe I'll say 80% of the virgin redwoods. And I watched over a period of sadly almost 20 years that less than 5% became the national park. And a lot of that was due to Ronald Reagan. I'm not afraid to speak up in this Orange <laughs> County territory Good that wanted the, vote of the, wanted the vote of the lumber industry yep. and delayed any type of activity until they could take their harvest their crop they call it of ancient redwoods and to a point of almost total decimation mm -hmm. I mean I, 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 there's less than I know there's less than 10 percent of what was originally there but as a, a young person I, I was in the Sierra Club and I thought that was the first activism that I actually wanted to take part in and then I moved from there the, the ocean absolutely has affected my paintings. I, I, I mentioned that before about the movement of fog is magic. And I don't see how anybody, there's not a lot of places in the world that fog interacts on the coastline like it does mm -hmm. right here with the Japanese current hitting the warm California uh, desert lands and creating this great myth. Down here in Southern California, it's not as dramatic as it is up in the Bay Area mm -hmm. and, and the <laughs> Northern it's California true, coastline, yeah. where you have this magic, different layers of fog coming in over the redwood trees. And as I said before, the best description I have is the dry ice effect of fog coming up, spilling over the roadway of the Golden Gate Bridge. And I've done many, many paintings of the Nepali coast in in the Hawaiian Islands, in the mm -hmm. Kauai, Hanalei Bay, we, we've, we it's been one of our treasure points for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I would just like to encourage everybody to take better care of our, our beaches and our shorelines. And I thank you both for, for what you're involved in because we need a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, if I, we, Dolly and I can help, we'd love to volunteer and uh, help you out on designing some artwork for your you, you PR. Can, yes, that Talk would be about the bus that we take out and we educate with the environment. Yeah, the, the Golden Gate Transit has their own transit system in Marin County. And to get young kids to encourage them to go out to watch the whales coming right alongside. Most people don't even know that, like Pescadero, the bluffs off of Pescadero, mm -hmm. Very few people really realize that they can take their families out and have a picnic on those bluffs and watch the whales migrating right along the shoreline within 100 feet of the waves. Mm -hmm. and you can see them all during the migration. And so what we did was volunteered to paint a regular uh, Golden Gate Transit bus with a life-size whale on it. If they would agree, this is 20 years ago, yeah, if they would agree <clears throat> to take children out to Point Bonita Lighthouse and be able to watch whales traveling right alongside That's a half great. an hour from their home. What a great partnership. Did it yeah. work? And it did so, no, yeah. Deer Valley, too, yeah. to Point Reyes. To yeah, lighthouse. well, what happened is they they claimed that uh, the insurance that wouldn't cover that, uh. going out on that Point Reyes road, because mm -hmm. it's a little dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we said, in, Okay, and, and acceptance of that, you got to give us something. So we've been taking Don out for the last 20 years, taking the bus out twice a month to elementary schools and talking about the environment and encouraging them to take, have their parents take them out to the whale migration. Mm -hmm. So the first whale bus was worn out after a million miles and they sold it off on <laughs> eBay. <laughs> so then I painted a, a much more involved bus with, with a total mural that took four weeks of all sea life. I mean of dolphins and sea turtles and uh -huh. sea lions, but primarily the major width of the whole bus was a life-size humpback whale. And that's still, 
she still takes it out to elementary schools. That's great. And that's been in uh, motion for 11 years now. So the total of 20 years, those buses have been promoting tr taking your family out to the ocean. Yes, yes, that's what we need to do. Inspire and educate. Inspire, that's a good word. That is great. So you're in your 70s. How yeah, has I'm in the my beach, 77. How, is, how have... <laughs> Compared to when you were young, how do people go to the beach more? Do they go to the beach less? Do you think the beaches, say, in Northern California are better? Are they about the same? Do they seem more degraded? So, so what's your seven well, decades of perspective on the beach? Has, has it, how has it changed? Well, are you, are you including population dynamics in this or just? You, you whatever. Well, okay. When I was a young kid, it was pretty amazing. I don't feel that old, but it, it, now I'm realizing I am that old. <laughs> that uh, 19th Avenue in San Francisco, from 19th Avenue to the ocean, was still sand dunes. Really? Giant, giant sand dunes. And almost every weekend, our parents would take us out. I mean, a lot of people would go out to the sand dunes because on a cold, foggy day, these sand dunes would radiate heat. Mm -hmm. And you climb up them, you, mm -hmm. you go up. I mean, they were very high. At least when you were a kid, they were even higher. And you could climb up them and roll down them, and, and you're still a half a mile from the beach. I mean, it went all the way to the beach line. So to watch houses built, doles are built in a daily city. You, you watch year by year, homes were built all the way right out to the coast. and. I remember what a main attraction for San Francisco was the Cliff House, the old, mm -hmm. the old sutras at the Baths. And when I was probably 15, they, they still, they had ice skating rinks put in the, where the, the Baths used to be. And they had a lot of, people went out to Playland at the beach, but there was a Which lot Which was an of, amusement park. Yes, uh, it's a roller coaster rides right on the, like I guess they have on the East Coast, but what was, to answer your question, there was many, many people, thousands of people out on the beach on the weekends enjoying it. And <clears throat> it's hard to tell now with population dynamics that there's still many, many people visiting the beaches. I think as far as degradation, I think the California Coastal Commission's done an amazing job, even though it's very restrictive in, in many ways that I'm sure uh, developers would, would like to shoot them, but I, I think I'm impressed by the quality of the coastline still being preserved very well for all the pressure that they have of population problems. And I think the number of state parks along the coastline is very impressive. I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, you can go all the way up the Oregon coast. I don't know if we're speaking of Californian specifics or whatever, but um, I'm impressed by the amount of activism that's taken place in the last 20 years t to keep development from, in, mm -hmm. you know, over uh, abusing the environmental coast. I feel like I always hear stories about things you're talking about when you were a kid or my grandma lived in Hawthorne and they would yeah. go sleep on the beach in the summertime. Yeah, right. And, um, oh yeah, and bonfires seemed, was a big thing. Yeah, yeah. Quite, and it seemed yeah, like it was much did. more open to all yeah. classes I, and, you know. And it, it, you know, that you brought up a good point because yeah. bonfires were a great activity yeah. for high school kids and everything mm -hmm. and we'd have giant bonfires which you're not allowed to do anymore. I mm -hmm. mean, they're like you two have places to get or something. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and that was part of growing up in a really a free place where laws did not dominate, you know, where more and more laws impacted the use of the land. Well, it seems like what the, at a smaller scale it was okay, right? And then sort of as population grows and people yeah. kind of push the envelope more is when it's more of an issue. I also feel like, I, I just wonder if gentrification in San Francisco and the Bay Area makes it less accessible to the, like, if you were a kid today, would you have that opportunity to go out on the beach with your family in the, you know, or would it be more sort of I think so but it, uh, in one problem I think there's a fear that's sadly cropping up and that's violence in our society mm -hmm. where 
families sometimes are reluctant to take their young children out mm -hmm. into different crowds of activities going on. But we've been lucky at San Francisco, at least on the ocean beach, I, I've seen very little crime there. I, I just think our society in general is posturing to, in the word of uh, helicopter parents, where they're afraid of letting their children go out. I mean, I grew up climbing the cliffs, and so did everybody I know out at Ocean Beach, you know, down the coastline. And if our parents ever knew what we were doing, they'd have heart attacks because you get 90% up this cliff and you're stuck. Yeah. You didn't have any helicopters to come mm -hmm. pull us out. And uh, I'm, in a way, I'm sorry kids don't have that adventure, that part of it. But it's been replaced with maybe, if you want to call it, zip lining activities and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it's a big job to keep these coasts clean and clear. Mm -hmm. And pollution's going to be a challenge forever because of our oceans being so polluted yeah, already. That's another problem. Mm -hmm. You stick it on the beaches, but you see what's floating up on the beaches. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's so many issues. The better or worse? I mean, it's a po not population, but, but the, the geomorphology, the shape, the, the landscape that is the beach, do you see that as, in general, uh, California-wide, has it gotten better? Has it stayed, is it sort of a neutral thing, or has it gotten worse over the... I mean, as far uh, as the erosion, or just the use just, in general, areas. would you say the beaches are the beaches, healthier? Yeah. The beaches are a little bit better, a little bit worse, or are they are they worse? Like you know, aggregate all the stuff together, all the people and the pollution and the. I, I think because sadly, because of population pressures, it's gotten worse. I mean, pollution. It, we all know about the gyres out there and the breaking down of plastics, and it eventually winds up on the beaches. These this pollution that never existed, or maybe it started 50 years ago, is vastly accumulating. And that's why I think it, it's going to take much more stronger activism mm -hmm. and scientific research to solve the problem. And, and it's going to have to involve a greater public at large, not just the usual doers, you know, the handful of people that are always doing it throughout history. And I think that's very viable. I think it's possible. I think. The better educated our young people are, the more activists they'll become. Mm -hmm. you know? I feel like with your art, even it, so much is inspired by the ocean and the coast, but then there's this other theme that you have of just the sense of wonder and curiosity and imagination that then connects the coast to space or yeah. to other. Virtually, landscapes. I've had so many people tell me over the years that they see exactly what I painted 50 years ago. The movement, I, I try to put movement in my paintings, and, and it was the initial watching of fog on the coast that really made it mystical. That, that I didn't have to paint photographic realism. I didn't want that anyway. I'd want to paint mysticism. And, and I think fog is a major, major contributor to my style of painting for the last 50 years. Even even underwater, I mean, it's strange, but the same motions, to put a motion of a whale going through the water, there's a tumbling motion and there's a mist that comes off the whale. And it's actually a San Francisco fog. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Do you have any other questions? So how, how have artists portrayed the coast differently? Like like so you do you've done always done lots and lots of art shows for decades and decades. So have you seen and you've done stuff in in coastal areas and stuff in in more inland areas. Have you seen the portrayal or 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 the use of the beach or the coast as a as a focus? Has that changed or not really? Or are yeah, people more interested in the beach? Are they less interested in the beach now versus in the fifties or seventies or whatever? Yeah, I don't, I don't see a huge change. I, 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 for myself, my peers, we're, we're in the, let's just say the anti, no, one won't talk about Danny and those guys, the uh, environmental movement. It's a, it's a G rated <laughs> interview. Yeah, we can't go into that. But the environmental activist artists, I'll call them, were subsequently small groups of pockets just like 
you wish there'd be 10,000 people, but maybe there's a 50 or 100 of you being really doing all the hard work. And <clears throat> actually the, the pioneers that I was involved with that were trying to express marine life degradation were a relatively small group of people that were became nationally or internationally known. And that group never really did enlarge, and, you know, even to date. Um, I guess I equate it like the Vietnam War where, where college kids and younger people were more active in That's pretty speaking out against injustices on the environment. And I don't see that eagerness right now is I, I don't think the dynamics have changed i guess that's the sad uh, part is, is are beaches more popular subjects now or for say art so clearly in in the vacation communities people always want to go to the beach and they want to buy a piece of beach art because it reminds them of of their time with their family or their their more relaxing you know something different than their normal experience do you see more of that or is it about the same I, yeah, I, I, I'd say it's the same. It, it's whatever people were getting involved with. Art is so broadly defined, it, from abstract art into realism, that the subject matters, I don't think have changed as much as artist styles. I mean, I, I think it's pretty much the same. I don't see a huge swing in the artist moving over painting the ocean, the coastlines uh -huh. or anything. Uh -huh. it, it's more coastal communities like you know along the art galleries along the coast have, have pretty much stayed the same way they have for the last 50 years i don't see a, a migration of artists mm -hmm. uh creating more ocean scenes you know mm -hmm. Maybe new and some of the artists getting a little too abstract from my yeah. opinion mm -hmm. a little new even technique. though i consider myself an impressionist painter and not a, a realist but I don't, under, I don't understand a lot of minimalism mm. where you have a, a painting that's solid yellow, maybe that color Sean's got it, and nothing else. School bus yellow? Uh -huh. Just a block <laughs> of yellow at the Museum of Modern Art with a value of two or three million dollars and somebody's going to try to tell you through pseudo intellectual speak about the real meaning the artist had of what was going on in this painting. And I, yeah. I find there's far too much of that going on mm -hmm. in the art world. Mm -hmm. And I call it charlatanism. <laughs> <laughs> What's the technique, right? But I, we're getting off the subject, yeah. People have done different techniques. But that's right? a good example yeah. of using a, a little tiny town with the ocean called mm -hmm. Little Jewel by the Sea. Mm -hmm. The Golden Gate Bridge is there, the fog's pouring over the ridge line mm -hmm. of Sausalito. And I find those uh, characteristics really enjoyable to paint mm -hmm. because it takes me back to my childhood with the ocean and we would do anything I think our whole family is very active to try to encourage anybody to get off their butt and become an activist mm -hmm. in this country. Well I think art is a great way to do that because you can yeah. really communicate the intrinsic value of the environment in a very way. It is. I was told when I started my career that if I started publishing posters, I would destroy my career. It would mm -hmm. be a commercial hack. And I have to say, probably now, uh, there's um, three or four hundred thousand posters have been circulated around the world, and they've all had an environmental message on them, you mm -hmm. know, primarily. And that was my way, or that's art way of trying to promote environmental protection mm -hmm. and I find that still very viable it's just a lot of artists can't afford to publish those right you know yeah. right and right now you're publishing with the whale and the elephant yeah swimming. well that's yeah I, I'm told in that project we're working on now kindred spirits can you, can you, or do you want to explain that What's Kindred Spirits? <laughs> kindred Spirits is, for a long time in, in my lifetime, I've been endeared to the elephants as much as the yes. whales. And I spent a couple weeks in Nepal riding elephants 40 years ago, and I never got over it. And I vowed sooner or later I'm going to do a series of paintings of elephants. And I, 
I hadn't done that. And I had three large canvases that I'd saved for super purposes, no matter how long it would take to paint them. They're 12 feet across by nine feet high. And I used a couple of them for painting outer space. But my real goal was how could I combine saving the whales and saving the elephants in one painting? Hmm. And I long had this dream of kindred spirits because I thought that's the bonding of the two of the gentlest, largest animals on the planet that are so intelligent that we haven't even tapped into the reality of it all. But the tragedy that in the last three years, 100,000 whales have been, elephants have been slaughtered. And how in the world could we do that? Because as awful as it becomes, it's become even more terrible. And going into zoos now and killing rhinoceroses for their horns. So Donna Lay and I set out to say, this is our time of our life to point our energy toward this crusade we want to be involved in. And I did this large painting of, uh, I don't know if we have an image of it, but it's a humpback mm -hmm. whale. Have you seen it? Mm -mm. It's a humpback whale passing in a lagoon on, on his back underwater. And he's embracing an elephant. Oh, wow. And the elephant's swimming in the water with his trunk above the, the water line. Uh -huh. And the message is that the great whales face the same extinction that the elephants are now, and they were able to survive. And the whales guiding him away Mm -hmm. to safety. Oh, that's great. I would love to see that. And they both need water. Right. You know? right. Yeah. Because it was hard to figure out how you're going to put an elf and a whale together. But mm -hmm. So that's the crusade. And this painting that I did, we initially were hoping to have it travel around the world and through China itself. Mm -hmm. Because what few people realize right now, there's a huge, huge sector and young people in China that are greatly embarrassed by the slaughter of the elephants and that are becoming activists in their own right with Greenpeace and other groups. And it's a, a larger movement than anybody ever expected to have their government pronounce wow. the, the cease, cessation of uh, mm -hmm. killing elephants for their mm -hmm. ivory. Well, art is such a great way to communicate that. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you think you would have had, you've had opportunities to connect with leaders and public figures around the world through your art and I feel like the fact that your art is inspired by the coast is yeah. the re I mean I think if you were just kind of painting ballerinas or something I don't know so something well, if you see you know, in this painting you'll see the swishing of the whale's tail and the elephant's feet and it still has that fog from San Francisco <laughs> <laughs> but I guess my question is do you feel like that the fact that you I feel like the fact that what you depict is something that other people have a connection to is sort of what well, the idea is, yeah. yeah, to try to get people to become activists. Mm -hmm. I mean, 96.org, elephants.org, that's just one group. There's there's maybe a dozen groups right now, but the idea is you're going to need a whole lot more of that, and time is really running out. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this is a massive slaughter going on right now that I I'm bothered by how little the public is involved in it. They might mm -hmm. say, oh, that's an awful thing, but they don't get on the phone to call their congressperson or their senator mm -hmm. or to write a letter, and that's all. That, that's what it would take primarily. Mm -hmm. And I just find we can't give up yet. We've got to still talk. No, that's true, and tapping into that connection with art is huge. So whether it's the whales or the elephants or the beaches, I yeah, think they're the all beaches. threatened in yeah. a way mm -hmm. that... I have a painting, really by the way, we, we did for the American Oceans campaign that yeah. we were going to make a poster out and never did, but maybe you guys can use it. It has a big wave on the ocean beach mm -hmm. with sea life swimming through the wave. Yes. Yeah. That sounds great. In fact, we'll, we'll donate the use of it to you. All right. It for you. That sounds great. What, if things get worse... If the seas rise and we have this coastal squeeze thing where essentially the beaches and the places where everybody can go to for free, generally speaking, or at least very cheaply, what would be lost if 50 years from now our beaches are fewer, are not as big, are more, are more um, tainted? What do you think, what would our society... Um, 
how, how would that impact our I society? I think a, a society would be at a tremendous loss for a natural sanctuary. People that have never seen the ocean, they're able to travel to the ocean from the Midwest and that it's a tremendous respite. It's, it's one of nature's greatest sanctuaries on this planet. And I see that as being a tremendous loss of society. Why? Why? What, what, what about it makes it a sanctuary? It's vastness, it's temperatures, it's sea life, it's wonderment. I mean, we live on an ocean planet, and that's the connection I know we all have to it. it it's what people really for the first time when they go see the ocean. We're spoiled, we see it every day almost. Mm -hmm. But to watch people that have never seen the ocean before, this jaw-dropping miracle on the planet, I think we've all become so used to it, we might take it for granted. I think mm -hmm. we, we should re-energize ourselves to gain much more respect of the ocean beaches. And I, I think it's gonna be a tragedy for or uh, the quality of life if our, we lose much of our, our access to the beaches. Mm -hmm. who, who doesn't go to the beach and find it refreshing? That's true. You know, yeah. Smell the salt air and just feel the breeze yeah. and hear that ocean wave crash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The health and well-being benefits are huge. The projects you've done like where the mountains meet the sea, ah, bringing yes. the ocean to yeah, we, we did a project for uh, Colorado called, where the well, the title of the painting I did, Donald is referring to, is Where the Mountains Meet the Sea. Do you remember that, Sean? Coors. Yeah, so they, Coors I'm was cured. sponsoring, Coors water. for the first time in the Midwest, they had never had a, a large aquarium. Hmm. There was nothing out there. I, I'm going back. You're talking about Colorado. Yeah. yeah. And, well, I mean, I don't think... I. To the best of my knowledge, okay, well, I don't know if we but it was Denver. Say. It was, it was right, wasn't it? The Denver. Yeah, that's aquarium. where it is. But I mean, there was nothing in the Midwest. There right. was no, right. uh, no aquariums like we have on the hmm. coast at all. Right. So Coors agreed to build this giant aquarium so people living in the Midwest can enjoy what sea life is all about. So I did a painting called "Where the Mountains Meet the Sea," and it was a subterranean mountain ch range underneath the ocean mm -hmm. and orca whales and all a lot of sea life interacting and that became a fundraiser to build that aquarium oh very neat yeah mm -hmm. i'll send you one of those posters yes i, I would love some. that too yeah so <laughs> yeah. so that's an interesting point because the environmental movement the conservation movement of the past has been built on the fact that they have advocates and you've articulated the notion that you need people to write letters you need people to be engaged right we seem to be at a point in our american at least politics society. well but politics but also it's 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 been happening for a long time but it's become more acute where it's okay to to sort of hate the other right when yeah. we painted the grand kid when when, when the lobbying effort was going on for creating the Grand Canyon's national park. It was Bierstadt did a you know painting and stuff, and then sent it back to Congress. That's right. And in those a lot of those park. guys never ever would go to the Grand Canyon or would never ever be able to see it. But the notion was we still recognize this thing that's not in my district or not in my sphere of influence. This the thing appears worthy of protection. Right. We seem to be entering an era. era where this is my stuff and I care about my stuff and, and it's almost like a sport to put down things that are away and and one of the popular refrains at least in political speak and stuff is it, it are the coastal elites and this notion that the coast is different from the quote-unquote bulk of the country so how do you think that might influence it? right I mean because 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 coast is part of what the president, what Congress, what all these people are articulating as bad places, as the place where you don't want to be associated with, or from whence people other than them or different creatures from other planet live. And that seems to me to be a concern. 
for well, coastal protection and other things. You're too. referring to the privatization of it seems land to be everywhere. I, I just mean it seems like we're more comfortable Thanks. being apart, and 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 taking yeah. pride in the fact that we're apart. And I'm not a part of that camp or that thought or that place. But most of, but you know, most of our country is not proximate to a coastline, and and these guys are talking about coastal protection. So what 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 might that how might art be able to help that conversation about not, yeah? Well, there's two different degrees here. Number one, the division in our country right now is the worst I've ever seen in my lifetime mm -hmm. between the have and the have-nots, if you want to call that. It's a type of privatization. And until we get our politics straightened out, no amount of art, I think, or anything else is going to be very productive. I think the state which I can say myself right now, of uh, the current president and it, their policies are extremely destructive to dividing this country even further and creating that sense of privatization that is pretty anti-American in general. I don't think we've ever had this degree of anger within our country. The country is ba badly divided. and. It's a mix of economics where people feel they, they're being uh, starved to death with the, with the lack of the economy. And I think a great deal of bullyism politically about a current administration that is trying to deconstruct this country's government. And it, it greatly involves, which you and I, I think, are is the virtual destruction of the EPA, or a good piece of it, to stop any further environmental progress that we've taken 40 years to develop. And the, the, the only good answer to that is our children's education. And we're just going to have to speak up more loudly and become more active. I, the, the, the planet's in danger. I mean, this morning, president says is going to withdraw from the Paris agreements. I mean, this is total insanity, and I don't see how, again, I'm politically free to speak, how one party in lockstep could agree that climate change doesn't exist or isn't a problem. You'd think there'd be a certain percentage of that party that would say, no, I can't go along with that. But as long as there's a total 100% lockstep marching position in a political party that's in control now, we're all in deep trouble and the environment's going to suffer the worst right now. I guess that doesn't answer your question very well, but it's how no, I you feel. Answered, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you answered it, you it becomes politics and, and until I guess we are, we're able to balance out our political system, the environmental movement's going to continue to suffer. suffer. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the irony to me is is the environment has become a dividing thing, a, a, a tool to divide people, and that seems to be crazy, because it, yeah. it seemed to be that everybody can appreciate a beach. Right. That's it would right. seem like it would be something, and everybody likes to breathe. Yeah. And clean air, eat, clean and water. And drink, and we would, I would think that that would be a source of, we could all agree on that in a, in a you so know. how does one party, instead of using natural resources, go to burn, baby, burn, and drill? I, I would say it's not one baby party. Drill. I would say it's not one party. I would say it's well, both parties. I, yeah, I and can't one party is that. very I, happy to say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's us. It, 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 it's, it's about coming together. And I think there's, there's both sides are we're happy to run to the corners, I think. It, it's interesting to me hmm. at the same time to see a great environmental film or documentaries come out that so few Americans actually go see. Right. We see these like Gasland and and the new uh, Al Gore movie coming out in come another out. month that these are phenomenally educational tools to say we now we have reason to speak up and talk to your senators and congressmen and yet they have some of the lowest attendances of any type of movie mm -hmm. instead of you know, Marvel Comics, but that's another area that I think we need to do a better job of 
promoting these documentaries. So, so clearly documentaries That's are the way right. to do it, but maybe maybe Marvel it's Comics right. is the way to do it. Yeah. It's, it's so, awesome. so in Star Trek yeah. Four, they yeah. used your painting mm -hmm. as as essentially the the nucleus of the the whole plot of the movie, and and that story was in the future Earth is screwed up because we've lost some of the biodiversity in the right. form of whales, right. and this space probe was coming. And and so that that so that was you know an action adventure and all this and that but 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 at the heart of it was this notion of we lose something as a society when we lose this part of our environment in that case whales yeah I thought mm -hmm. Star Trek it was Star Trek Five actually I thought it was yeah. very where they beamed up beamed up the whales the whales I thought it was four you sure it wasn't four I, I think, think it. I think, I think you fun. might be right. I think it might be Star Trek. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. you would know. I, I didn't want to go oh, again. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah. Let's go all, too. like, nerd on I don't want to be alternate <laughs> facts. Okay. Yeah, but then, yeah, then no, that, I wouldn't either. I haven't quite come to any of the dates or anything else. When Voyager 2 did the um, CD well, and yeah. got the... I, I was on and Leonard Nimoy called me up. I pick up the phone at our studio in Sausalito. and says, George, this is Leonard Nimoy. I heard you're the artist painting whales in space, and I thought, is this really a Leonard Nimoy? Yeah. <laughs> and I had a long talk with him, and he told me what, what this whole movie was. I was very flattered that he wanted to know if I said I'd be totally honored to have the painting put in the picture. Mm -hmm. It was called The Ultimate Voyager. Right. That's and great. The movie, I don't know if we want to go into this, but the movie mm -hmm. had so much reflection on my own personal life that there were so many coincidences including beaming up whales into space, that I was a gardener in the Golden Gate Park at the same area where they landed the spaceship in, oh, wow. in, the, in Golden the Golden Gate, Gate Park. Park. And there was a lot of nuances there that I felt like it was written It was, I think so. I experienced in my lifetime. Uh -huh. And the Golden Gate Bridge and, and Marin County and this so-called uh, research center in the movie was actually a block from my studio in Sausalito. Oh, wow. So there's all these little things that went Nuances, together. Yeah. So when I took all my buddies to see the movie, yeah. I, I hadn't seen it. I didn't know what was in it. And we finally got to where the painting was. That, you know, They all looked, leaned forward. I mean, Forbes and all those guys, and they yeah. all stood up and clapped. Clap. Oh, that's, and, exciting. <laughs> that's great. But it was. It was similar. Yeah, it was, it was really, a really similar. A, but you're right, it was experience. about saving the whales. You know? and, and the same with, uh, we used it, Sean was there, Don Lee was there, that we used uh, a painting to that I created for World Peace called The Peacemakers. And mm -hmm. it took three years to get it to President Gorbachev about hopefully we put a lid on nuclear war. And to dream up that painting at nighttime a painting the dolphins in space orbiting the earth called the peacemakers and it's seven feet tall these are large paintings and I dreamt that up and then dreamt of Gorbachev reaching out and hugging me at the same time and three years later it happened but, and it's all on film uh -huh. so anytime I tell these stories I say there. it's all yeah. it doesn't, you don't get there and Sean really the easy. second one right. Sean we got unveiled, Sean. unveiled the painting it became two paintings, mm -hmm. and four years later, we gave him another one of the baby holding the earth in his hands. Right. And uh, but anyway, art can be an yes. instrument of great. And, but I, th I think that's, that's a story I tell, and that's a that's a good one. So that I usually start that story with you with the beached whale. Yeah. On the beach. At Pescadero. And, and, and yeah, yeah, and you're like checking it out and. Historically, people painted whales. Even your initial whales were um, deformed in the You're sense right. that they're inactive. Yeah. In the yeah. sense that they're from people looking at stranded whales that are distorted, their bellies. That's their, right. You know, and so good so point. you there tend no to get good photographs right, and you tend yeah. tend to get like the mouth and the throat were distended and, yeah. and 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 almost caricatures of whales. And then over your lifespan, people have gotten more 
more realistic and accurate in terms of portrayal. So I start I start out with that lecture with you in the seventies with your bell bottom pants on the beach, <laughs> on the beach feeling out the whale and looking at it. Yeah, the which, size which, of which the technically blue is whale. probably illegal. We won't talk about that. <laughs> violating, <laughs> violating the Marine Mammal Act. But the, but but the point is, remember Alaska, the kids sliding down the back yeah, of the whale. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Well, that was legal. That was <laughs> that permitted. Was that was, I'll just say they that was permitted. They were Alaska, that but, but, no. but but oh, but but yeah. but that whole thing of the whale. And then, and then, you know, various things happen, and all these things happen, and then you get the inspiration to use marine mammals as a as a symbol for peace, and then you end up giving the painting to Gorbachev at Stanford, and all that kind of stuff, and, and it just sort of shows, I think, one small example of how the value of a healthy, vibrant active, diverse coast right. can inspire all kinds of stuff. And, and who would have thought mm -hmm. that, that, you know, whales or dolphins or critters on the beach right. would have anything necessarily to do with global peace and right. ending the Cold War and having yeah. having more friendly relationships with people. But that, that becomes, again, art a venue to to have those conversations when maybe it's more difficult to have them straight up. And you can use that yeah. as almost a crowbar to get in to have conversations. You, you remember that conversation, conversation. with Gorbachev yeah. that he was I wanted to hug him and they said, don't reach out, don't try to hug him, don't do... And I had a, a gold pen, and this is at Stanford, of a, of a dolphin. And when Gorbachev, and he had a translator and his wife was in the crowd there, mm -hmm. but it was really natural, it wasn't awkward. I, I thought, how am I going to, how are we going to talk? It was just like you're talking to each other. and. There's one part where we get to, he's trying to define what the meaning of the painting is. And he, he spent, which I thought was a really a long time, it was probably five or six minutes. On, on the curb, in a big crowd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At I, the from, campus. Impromptu. Where in the they campus. had me locked up in a room where they didn't want to show the painting because mm -hmm. I'm a hippie yeah. street artist. That's another story. Oh, golly. But I wiggled my way down anyway. Never say die. That's mm -hmm. right. To get him to accept his painting. But the point was that we're... He defined the painting. The message he initially gave me wasn't really what I had in mind. And he wa he's this sharp. He's watching me. And he, he knows I didn't make a frown. I just, I'm smiling. But he knew it was. So then he redefined it and he hit the nail on the head. So then we got to a point about it. So the dolphins, you know, they're, he says they're very beautiful animals. And I said, I think they're a little smarter than us, you know. And I looked at him and he looked at me and he says, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then he reached out and hugged me. Uh, and that was the highlight. What was of that amazing meeting. was when Gorbachev said, "Well, I thought that the dolphin was like when he was talking with Reagan. Yeah. That they were actually trying to bring the e the Soviet Union at that time. Well, and of course, it America wasn't with together. Reagan. I mean, yeah. I mean, I well, didn't want Reagan. In right. fact, Reagan, I didn't want to have any part of it. But he was, he was, he was thinking that it was Coming together. just what you're Come saying. Come on, Reagan saved trestles. Come on. <laughs> Okay. We have to give him something. He saved trestles? <laughs> but he did think of it like that. Yeah, with the Redwood That was an amazing, just what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And the United Nations is using art to celebrate the 50th anniversary we did that. of San Francisco. It was born in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. The charter was signed in San Francisco. Correct. Yeah. And so we went back. that's a painting we did for the 50th anniversary of Earth from Outer Space with mm -hmm. the Golden Gate Bridge with a fog pouring over it and this new sunrise coming up from around the Earth. It's, it's still in the Secretary General's office. Mm -hmm. to this yeah, day. but poor old Boutros isn't around anymore. <laughs> no, he's, that, that's he's, several, several. That's several uh, Secretary General removed. Yeah, yeah. that was 1994, was That's it? one of the few regrets I have, is I thought we should steal some of the banners they had on the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You oh, thought, you thought we could somehow get the guys to give it to us? I thought, yeah. I thought we should have stolen them. From the UN, stolen yeah. them. UN? The United we got Nations, one. they had yeah. banners all over yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. Hmm. I had this idea because we are doing toast last night, and I was wondering if you had a nice glass of water there, if you would like to do a toast to the coast. A toast to the coast? I'd love to do a to toast, to coast. toast to the coast. And if you notice, this is just the Manhattan <laughs> Beach. Yeah. The, the now That's right. Where, they, where you guys <laughs> were yeah. spending well, a lot of time. Well, we, can't, we should have a glass of wine. I'll, I'll, I'll go okay. with you. A toast yes. to the coast. <laughs> I'll do yours. And we want many, many more people becoming involved in the... Save the oceans, save the planet, save the coastlines immediately. Mm -hmm.
right? That's great. And That's these two girls Cheers. switch the camera yeah. over. And these two girls are gonna be our new heroes. <laughs> yeah. You mean these ladies <laughs> right here? You mean these ladies <laughs> right here? Yep. Oh, nice. And this little sweet one here. Oh, my number one. Yeah. This is my number one support number one. team. Oh. Right? I'm gonna live my life. Thank you. Do, do, do. Oh, do, do, do. do you guys yes. have any last questions? Yeah. <laughs> I I don't think so. I think yeah. you did a great job. I think well, we'll follow up with you on Zoom if we need to. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much. You <laughs> can't figure out Zoom. <laughs> what are you talking about? Call him on the phone. Oh. Yeah. You know, off the record, I mean, mm -hmm. this oh, I'll turn one it off. of its.